I dream of a city called glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how easy it is to hear words we've heard before and then kind of drift away thinking our own thoughts over and over again. Wake us up, Lord, as we listen to your word being read so that we might we might hear what we haven't heard before and take delight in being awake to life anew in Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hear these words that come from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Going through a long line of prophets, God has been addressing our ancestors in different ways for centuries. But recently, he spoke to us directly through his son. By his son, God created the world in the beginning, and, it, and it, uh, all that belonged to the son at the end. This son perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with the nature of God. He holds everything together by what he says, very powerful words. And after he finished the sacrifice for our sins, the son took his honored place high in the heavens, right alongside God, far higher than any angel in rank and rule. Now, God didn't put angels in charge of this business of salvation that we're dealing with here. It says in Scripture, what is man and woman that you bother with them? Why even take a second look their way? You made them not quite as high as angels, bright with Eden's dawn light, and then you put them in charge of your entire handcrafted world. When God put them in charge of everything, nothing was excluded, but we don't see it yet. Don't see everything under human jurisdiction. What we do see is Jesus made not quite as high as the angels and then uh, through the experience of death crowned so much higher than any angel with a glory bright with Eden's light. In that death, by God's grace, he fully experienced death in every person's place. Makes good sense that the God who got everything started and keeps everything going now completes the circle by making the salvation pioneer perfect through suffering as he leads all these people to glory. Since the one that saves and those who are saved have a common origin Jesus doesn't hesitate to treat them as family, saying, I'll tell my good friends, my brothers and sisters, all I know about you. I'll join them in worship and praise to you. The word of God for the people of God. God. Have you ever meditated on cows? <clears throat> cows. Cows. You know, cows, C-O-W-S, or as they say in Scotland, cows. There you go. I took some time not long ago to do just that very thing, to meditate, contemplate, cogitate about cows and all things cow. Did you know? That if you call a cow by its name, that it will give you more milk. Did you know that? I'm not, I didn't make this up. If you just show a little bit of kindness, a little bit of a personal touch, that cow will be a whole lot more productive. And then as I thought about it, I go, you know what? Maybe that's something that's true about us too. Now, to show you that I'm not just, I'm not completely nuts, there are some parts missing. There is a study that has come out of England uh, that it was reported in USA Today, and it reveals that the affectionate treatment of cattle, including giving names to cows, it increases the amount of milk that they give. The average cow produces somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2,000 gallons of milk every year. But if you know that cow by name and if you call that cow's name, then she will give you an extra 68 gallons. 
It's true. Now, there's a message here for us today. This is what, this is what I like to call, uh, call moves you can use. And so we're going to milk it for all it's worth. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. It was bad. <laughs> so work with me here. A researcher by the name of Catherine Douglas of Newcastle University says that farmers always have believed that when you name a cow, it has a positive effect. If you grew up on a farm like I did, then you already know this is true. We had names for, for all of our cows and our pigs and our chickens, and, you know, we named everything. But until now, there really has not been any scientific evidence to prove that. Her study shows that if a cow is not given individual attention, then it's likely to become uncomfortable around human beings. It becomes stressed. And a stressed cow releases a chemical that's called cortisol. And cortisol inhibits milk production. But now cow-friendly farmers name their cows and they make contact with their cows from a very early age. They chat to them, Douglas observes. They walk among the cows and they speak with the cows. You know, that kind of reminded me of, a, of something. You know, the old hymn, remember? And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. I'm not going to sing it because I'm, you know, Brother RJ can do that a whole lot better than I can, but... You get the picture. John Banson, who's the owner and operator of an organic dairy farm in Oregon. To me, organic dairy farm is like three, is, it's about two terms too much. All you have to do is just say farm, you know. A farm is organic, is it not? You know, okay. He, he has this organic dairy farm in Oregon, and he has 165 cows, and he knows, he calls every single one of those cows by name. He has a personal name for every single one of them. His favorite cows are Cinder and Ajax and Hawk. Now, it was his grandfather that started doing this, making the rule that nobody could ever be a head milker at his dairy unless they first could identify every single one of those cows by name. A cow that is happy and calm is always going to produce more milk, says Banson. He's convinced that when you name a cow, combined with really understanding the animal and their behavior, then you are going to increase milk production. So cows that are known by name will be happy and calm and productive. Anonymous cows will be stressed and unproductive. Now, for a lot of us, that just sounds kind of, it sounds intuitive, doesn't it? Makes sense. And God knows that the very same thing really applies to you and I, you and I. Now, it's true that in Scripture, probably the most common metaphor that is used for the children of God is what? Sheep. But, you know, a metaphor is a metaphor, and I decided that this morning we're going to try to change that metaphor, maybe look at it a little bit differently. So today we're not going to talk about sheep, we're going to talk about cows. So just kind of wrap your head around, the, around a new idea. I know it might make it hurt just a little bit, but you'll be okay. Jesus, you could say, is a cow-friendly Christ, and like it or not, we are the cows. And all God's people said, Moo! <laughs> In this letter of, to the Hebrews, it says, going through a long line of prophets, God has been addressing our ancestors in a in a lot of different ways down through the centuries, but recently he has spoken to us through the Son. God sent Jesus to walk among us, to speak to us, to show us God's will and God's way by having that relationship with us. 
Jesus is the one that very perfectly mirrors God. You want to know what God is all about? Then all you have to do is look at Jesus. It's what he told his disciples. If you have, when they said, Philip said, oh, show us God. We want to see. Jesus said, look at me. To see me is to see the Father. Jesus perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with the nature of God. We are told he holds everything together by his very word. Sounds to me an awful lot like what we find in the very first chapter of John where the apostle writes, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and it lived among us and we seen the glory. Glory as, a, as of the father's only son full of grace and truth. God has spoken to us by a son he sustains all things by his powerful word. The word became flesh and lived among us. Have you ever stopped to think what those words actually mean? It means that God is not out there distant somewhere. He's right here with us. That he's not silent, but he's always trying to communicate with us. He's not harsh, but he's full of grace and truth. And Hebrews goes on to say that the one that saves and the one who is saved, both have a common origin. And for that reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Now, when Jesus taught and when he told stories, he liked to use Images from rural life about to, to illustrate points about the kingdom of God. So just kind of picture this, this down to earth and very highly human Jesus. Maybe kind of chewing on a weed, you know, like farmers do. Out in the field, he's standing out there with us. And he's, a, he's like a dairy farmer. He's walking among the cows. And he's calling them brother and sister. And, and he's praising God in the midst of an endless herd of humanity. And he's calling every single one of us by our name. Showing us a little kindness. A little human touch. And then taking time to get to know us. And all those kind of odd and weird and strange behaviors that we all have. Now, I'm guessing that you've probably heard a, an untold number of sermons about sheep and how we Christians so very often behave like sheep. But this morning, I want you to consider this new metaphors. You see, like cows, we've got a wide range of personalities from those who want to be in line first to those who really don't mind being last. Those who like to fuss and fidget all the time, you know, all the way to, uh, to the other end of the spectrum where others are calm. Reminds me of the story about the Quaker farmer. And he's milking his cow one morning and the cow gets all upset and fidgety as cows are wont to do from time to time. And kicks over the milk bucket. Well, the old Quaker gentleman just very calmly sets the bucket back up and continues to milk and it's not long old cow starts fidgeting again kicks it over and the old gentleman just still very calm he picks it up and he he starts milking one more time and then the third time that cow kicked that bucket over well the quaker gentleman got up off the stool and he walks around the front of the cow and he takes the cow by the ear and whispers in it he said oh cow he says, thou knowest that I wouldst not harm thee, but now know that I will sell thee to a Methodist who will. <laughs> <laughs> there, cows have all kinds of personalities just like we do. And within any given herd, you know, if you ever raise cows, there is a very well-defined hierarchy where you have one cow that usually acts as the leader. 
Now, Jesus understands this about us, and he grasps those very distinctive identities that each of us have. Now, we don't often have time to paint this picture of Jesus. More often, we're thinking about Jesus as the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Some other Christians see Jesus as the great rabbi or the cosmic Christ or the monk that rules the world or the universal man or the mirror of the eternal, the teacher of the common sense, the poet of the spirit, the liberator, never as the dairy farmer. But you see, there is something to be said for an image of Jesus as a farmer who is in the pasture with us. See, it's very close to that biblical image of the shepherd, the one who calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. He goes ahead of them, says Jesus, and the sheep follow him because they, they hear his voice. And then it's the very same Christ who for a little while was made lower than the angels who walked among us, made us happy, made us calm, and it was all for our benefit, says the writer of Hebrews. Now, it's obvious, of course, that he didn't go to all his trouble for angels. It was for folks like us, children of Abraham. Jesus comes to help us like a farmer who comes to care for us, calls us by name to make us more productive, and it's clearly it's clear that Jesus wants us to be productive. He wants us to produce good milk. And he wants lots of it. My father is glorified by this, said Jesus, that you bear much fruit and that you become my disciples. And I guess the question for us this morning is, are we giving Jesus what he wants? Now, we are going to be the most productive for God when we are happy and calm instead of stressed and uncomfortable. And Jesus knows this. He knows that we're not going to bear a whole lot of fruit if we're, if we're stressed about our salvation. We're not going to give good milk if we feel guilty about uh, not uh, volunteering enough. That we're not going to do good work if we are uncomfortable about our biblical knowledge. We're not going to be very productive if we feel bad about not being green enough or holy enough or prophetic enough or spiritual enough. You're starting to get the point. You see, it is better to be blessed than stressed. And Jesus came to bless us, not stress us. Or, as John puts it, Jesus came here to save, not to condemn. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. People who believe in Jesus are not condemned, and this assurance of salvation should be enough to help us be happy and calm and productive disciples of Jesus Christ. What a difference it makes to know that Jesus loves us and that he cares for us, that he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. I had a fellow in church one time, a fellow by the name of Lily York. Isn't that a weird name or what? was an older fellow. He was almost 100 years old. And I went up. He had to go way back up in the woods to visit him. And when I pulled up, he was sitting on the front porch and and I said, uh, I said, are you Mr. York? And he says, yeah. I said, there was some folks over at the church said they were relatives of yours and asked me if I'd come up here and visit you. He said, they're relatives of mine. And I said, yeah. He said, well, do they claim me? <laughs> yeah, Jesus claims us. He ain't ashamed to call us brother or sister and walk with us and talk with us and tell us that we are his own. But you see, this leaves us with a challenge. 
and that is to grow in relationship with Jesus by working at it day after day after day after day. We tend to do in our relationship with Jesus just like we tend to do in all our other relationships, and that is at some point we kind of put them on autopilot, you know. We figure we've put enough work into it, we've paid our dues, and so we just hit that little red button and we just expect for it to be smooth sailing. But it is something that we we can't do that with. We have to work at it. The good news today, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus Christ loves you just exactly the way you are. The other part of that news is he, he loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants you to grow in relationship with him and to become more productive. And like any good friendship or marriage or any kind of long-term relationship... You got to give it some kind of priority and really work at it if it's going to be a healthy, life giving, and fruitful relationship. When the saints of the church become deeply spiritual, they have a driving need to respond to the needs of others. So getting close to Jesus actually makes us more productive Christians. We've been placed under the care of of Jesus the Christ who according to this writer of Hebrews in the last days is the very expression of God. But like all good cows, let's not forget that our job is to produce. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you have loved us first and help us never forget that You are love so that this sure conviction might triumph in our hearts over the seduction of the world, over the disquiet of our souls, over the anxiety we have for the future, our fears of the past, over the distress of the moment. But also grant that this conviction might discipline our souls so that our hearts might remain faithful and sincere in the love with which we bear to all of those whom you have commanded us to love as we love ourselves. For we pray in Christ's name, amen.